Since March of 2020, our lives and daily routines have been altered completely by COVID-19. Many of our businesses are closed, with the exception of those providing essential services. Our clubs and committees are refrained from meeting. We are reduced to seeing loved ones through phone screens and friendly faces through protective glass. Some of us have ancestors to have proudly called Ratdowney home, while some of us are new to the community and are able to see the ghost of what it was in the old buildings and monuments scattered throughout the town. Leash has been called home to people for over 8,000 years and its people have seen triumphs and defeats throughout history. The town of Ratdowney has prevailed through much. Since its founding in the 9th century, it has survived wars and a famine. It has been the place of home to families divided over politics and religion only 100 years ago. We see old pictures of the square featuring people long gone. We've placed plaques and monuments in memory of Ratdowney natives that were tested by dark times throughout history. We are the children of those who survived the Great Famine. We are the children of those long ago who defended Grantstown Castle and of their descendants' children who later played games upon its ruins. Our grandparents witnessed the raid of anti-treaty Republicans in 1922 and their grandparents remember Queen Victoria passing through the town during the height of Black 49, announcing here to be a quaint village surrounded by hills, an idyllic small town. Our home has stood strong through so much, with its people facing grievous obstacles as a community. If history has taught us anything, it is that the people of Ratdowney will prevail this battle too. Though COVID-19 has cost lives of our loved ones and cast a cloud of weariness and grief over the town, this video will serve as a monument in its own right and a nod to those who have faced worse challenges before us. We will speak to the people of Ratdowney and cement in history what this experience was like and how we coped. It will serve as a reminder to our children and grandchildren how the people of Ratdowney have continuously prevailed. How if we can survive this by pulling together, Ratdowney will continue to survive anything. Hi, I'm Liz. I'm the practice nurse here in the health centre in Ratdowney with Dr. John Paul Campen and Dr. Amanda Maguire. So I'm just going to have a few words about how COVID affected us here. So back in early March, Dr. John Paul came in one day and he told us we have to lock the door and empty the waiting room. We can no longer have 
two people in a waiting room it's down to one now so people now have to ring and make their appointment they um, have to come to the door ring the doorbell and we go out and let them in so we filter them on the phone so when they ring initially when, the, when it all started we had a questionnaire that we had to ask them for to see had they any covid symptoms and if they had we took their phone number and their um, air code and we rang them, the doctor rang them back and went through the symptoms. Then he referred them straight directly. They never came inside the health centre if they were anyway related to COVID and they went directly to get tested. So that was a great saving on the people that would be in the health centre and ourselves even to keep it. We're no good to anybody if we were out sick ourselves. So um, it, he was ahead of the posse with all that really. So. I don't think that it'll ever go back to people in a waiting room anywhere. I think it'll stay like that. Um, it's it's a great way of cr preventing cross infection of all kinds, really. Do you know? So we stop them at the door. We ask, most people ring, and people in general have got used to it very quickly. Now we do understand the phone can only take one phone call at a time. We only have one line coming in. There is no point in getting a second line because there's no one to answer it. If you're on one phone, you can't answer another. So we just ask people to be patient and give it, give another try if you don't get through the first time. We don't have it off the hook or we're not filing our nails. We are talking, and <laughs> talking to somebody else. And people are a bit nervous. They do talk a little extra long on the phone. We understand that too. Well, in, not quieter. We're, we're, we're working equally as hard and we're see, still seeing everybody that needs to be seen. We're still seeing people for vaccinations, for antenatal care, postnatal care, anybody with different ailments to COVID related, all of them are being seen still. It is uh, just children are out of school, so that makes ch children don't get sick in general. There's very little cross infection when they're not in school. Who knows what August when they go back to school and back to creches is going to bring. And it's also going to fall in with the flu season for this year. So it could be busy come autumn and winter, really. Yeah. A little in the beginning, but after a week, it, the public are great. You know, everybody, old people, young people, they all understood it very quickly. They're all great. They make their phone call in the morning. and. It's the same when we all have to go to our dentist, it's the same. You don't see anybody else waiting in the waiting room when you go anywhere, do you know? And it, you are safer in your car waiting, you know, you are safer. And it's less stressful for mammies with kids to be in the car than having them pulling out of somebody else in the waiting room anyway. It's great. I mean, and we also had to tell people when they're coming for their appointment, they come alone. If they have a child sick, they just bring that child. Unfortunately, they can't bring on all the kids, they'll have to get somebody to mind the other kids. That's probably difficult on parents, all right. Yeah, I do think, I think for all kinds of cross infection, it's a great idea not to have a crowd in the waiting room. But I do think it's not going away in a hurry. And it is a dangerous virus and people shouldn't take it lightly. They should take the necessary precautions and distance and hand wash and all those simple things that we've been told to do are necessary and we should heed what we're being told because it's not going away until we get a, a vaccine really. So it's the new norm. I mean, we have very, very little in fact, a virus of the virus around Rat Downey, around Leash. Unfortunately, poor patients in Ward 6, that was very sad for the staff and for the patients there. We would have known a few of them here. They would have been residents in Erkin House at one stage. So we were very sad for all them and they did great work, you know, they do great work down in St. Vincent's in Ward 6. So we're very sorry about all the, those who lost their lives in that. But in general, it has been good and people have heeded the precautions around here. Do you know, I actually worried about people in shops more than ourselves, really, because we had the door locked. We were able to take care of people here. But, you know, in the shops, the poor staff were quite vulnerable initially. You know, now they have precautions in place, but really they were very quite open to cross-infection and viruses there. But anyway, it has been addressed, thank God. Right. Uh, my name is John O'Malley. I'm from Rat Downey here. My father was from Rat Downey and my grandfather came here in 1911. Uh, he was originally from Clare Island and arrived here selling Singer sewing machines. So 
the corner house for, for sale at the time and he married a local girl after a, a whirlwind romance of eight weeks. And uh, so they bought the corner house, so we're here since 1911. Well, like I said, it, it's a family institution, so this is the first time in 109 years that the place was ever closed. So it's quite remarkable, really. Uh, so, and um, it's, it's difficult for people who have been used to coming into the pub down through the years. Um, and, you know, but we're a remarkable nation because we're able to adjust to uh, extraordinary situations. And my hat's off to everybody the way they adjusted in this situation. Yeah, it's going to be very difficult in an awful lot of pubs in the country. But this one here, we're very lucky because First of all, the size of the pub is quite big inside and we have a, a, a round bar, so which means that we'll be able to space things quite well around the bar. But like I said to you, for a, the vast majority of pubs, it's going to be very, very difficult because they're mostly small pubs throughout the country. And um, it's going to be really difficult because in some of them, like you wouldn't put 10 in the pubs anyway. So you know, there won't be just room for people, and that's, they probably might not ever open again. And well, it's been, it's been very difficult on an awful lot of people. Um, older people in particular, and younger people, and, and you know, uh, Ratdown is a very sporty town, and there are a lot of sports played, like there's, um, GA is huge around the area, with young people, and, uh, <clears throat> So with the, with the GA sort of gone, it leaves a huge vacuum in people's lives. And then you have all the other things like, you know, there's a huge amount of different types of clubs. The Camogies, the soccer club, you know, the, the uh, I, I believe there's a Taekwondo uh, course, and then the golf club, and just, it's, it's after being extraordinarily difficult, but people have adjusted amazingly well. Uh, my name is Mary Prendergast and I'm, the owner, of, I'm the owner of the card stand here in Ratdowney. I'm here for 26 years, and this has been the hardest couple of months I think in the 26 years we've been here. Um, it was very, very hard at the start, very stressful. Um, you were very worried about your staff and your customers. It was, it was a big learning curve because we always thought we had a lovely clean shop that was, that was perfect, but obviously we had to up our step. So. Um, the first thing was getting in a screen, which my brother-in-law, Boo Boo, did. He did a great job. Um, that definitely felt a bit of security for both the customers and the staff, that, you know, that it's just a bit of security. Yeah. Um, then hand sanitizer, cleaning the shop more regularly, cleaning the countertops. At the start, it was. Yeah. Um, I had a cousin who, he brands cattle. So he had a lot of it. So he gave me some at the start to get me over the hump so that I could get it. Now I can get it, no problem. Very hard to know, very hard to see when my screen will come down, because I, yeah. I do want it down. Um, I think there'll be hand sanitizer on the counter forevermore. I think that's going to be part of life from now on. Um, but it's hard to know, it's hard to see. I have a lot of older customers who I miss and when they'll be able to come back in again, it's very hard to see them having the confidence to come back in. I'm doing a paper round every morning, so I'm delivering papers or cigarettes or lotto or whatever. I have about 15 or 20 that I'm regular customers who can't come in anymore. So they have their paper every day, which to a lot of people is important. Definitely your cleaning habits have changed. Um, the end counter where we sweet, I'd say there'll always be gloves there. Like I said, I reckon there will always be hand sanitizer on the counter, and I think staff behind the counter as well. I think it's, we're just going to get into a way of life of washing our hands more and sanitizing more. It was very, very hard at the start. People were very nervous, didn't know what to do. Um, but then as people got into the routine of it, they now know to stand outside the door, look in the door, can I come in? Like, I mean, that would never happen before. Um, but once people, were aware of what to do and know what to do. Everyone, as far as I'm concerned, was very good and adhered to what they were supposed to be doing. I'm Helen Fortune, um, myself and my husband, Pat Fortune. Um, we run Fortune's Drapery in Rathdowney, County Leash, on the main street here. It's a fourth generation 
business, a uh, family business, a uh, Pat's family, and uh, we have been running it for the last uh, about 35 years. And uh, we cater for, you know, uh, sports, ladies, men's, gents, women's, footwear. We do a bit of everything, so it's, it's a broad spectrum. So, um, yeah, we've been here a long time and we have a nice broad base. Like 18, 90 something is on the okay, door. Well, we'll I should know, we painted it recently. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's four generation, so yeah. Well, it um, has been, I suppose, devastating for a lot of small businesses like ours. We just had to completely just shut the door on the 23rd of March. Um, it was a shock to everybody. You know, we were looking forward to maybe a good year, you know. Um, uh, we'd be heading into spring, summer, and the summer stock would be coming in and looking forward into school uniforms, which is a good trade. We have a lot of support from all the schools in the district. So, you know, we were lining up for a nice, a good year, and that all came to a sudden halt. So it was a bit of a shock. Um, we've coped well with it though. We, we do feel that it's in the best interest of ourselves, our families, all our customers who are not only customers, but also friends, I would nearly consider them at this stage. And uh, so we have to protect everybody. So I really think it was necessary, you know. So um, we are missing all our customers, our friends for chats and, you know, we really miss them all and just particularly there's some that are into us every week, you know, they might necessarily buy, but we, we love to see them coming in the door. <laughs> we will, um, first of all, we probably have to limit the amount of people. Look, it's a small shop. We don't expect crowds, you know, we're, we're, we're well aware of our, you know, our, our, how many would be coming in. So it just, if there was, uh, happened to be more than three or four, we'd maybe ask somebody if they'd hold on and wait outside. And um, we might have a one-way system around the shop. We'd also have a station for sanitizing and we'd have um, probably plastic gloves, that kind of thing for changing clothes. We'd also have to have some protocols on trying on clothes and uh, sterilizing maybe. Also, we have a steamer. So we'll, we'll have to figure all that out probably. We're still in the process of getting ready. So um, just we are looking forward to opening, of course, you know. I, I think it, it would be good for people too to, to meet others. And But I think everybody, if everybody respects the guidelines and respects, you know, I think we've learned how to respect the guidelines. I think that was a good lesson we've all learned by closing. So now that we're kind of educated on it maybe, now when we open, I think hopefully people will respect the guidelines. <laughs> and I would like to sit in a garden with a few friends and, you know, have a glass of wine and uh, good chat. We miss chatting. That's what we but all But I have to say, social media has been wonderful and, you know, WhatsApp groups and we have, we can sit at home and have a glass of wine and still talk to each other. We just can't share the nibbles. <laughs> <laughs> so. So uh, my name is Dominic McAvoy, I'm the principal in St. Fergus College. Um, St. Fergus is a school in the Lee Shoffley ETB. It's a second level school, it's got 300 pupils and we take pupils from the surrounding catchment area and we've got 25 teachers on staff. Um, it, it had a devastating effect in, on, on one level on the state exams. Um, obviously with our junior certs um, we had to uh, contend with initially whether there would be exams in the autumn or not uh, but that has now been resolved so the teachers are going to mark them based on their work to date and uh, part of that was difficult because uh, since the 12th of March the students haven't been in school and depending on what subjects they were doing uh, they would have completed more work or less work in some subjects they would have had project work but that may not be completed um, so teachers will have to use their judgment when they're applying the marks. But for the junior certs, it'll just be a school grade they're getting, it won't be a junior cert exam. For the leaving certs, there was a lot of talk and discussion about whether the exams would go ahead or not. But now we've come to a, a new situation where the teachers will be doing calculated grades for each of the students. And that's an unfolding situation at the moment. Yeah, so with the leaving certs, we're going to have to look at um, how well the, the teachers know their students and their progress and participation to date. Now, a lot of people talk about the mock exams, but the mock exams are fraught with difficulty because some teachers grade hard, some teachers grade easy, and in many cases they don't have the full course finished, or if they have the course finished, they haven't done a lot of revision for the mock exams. So there won't be a huge emphasis on the mock exams. It'll have to be balanced up by the marks the students were getting throughout the year in sixth year and also throughout the year in fifth year. And also the teacher's professional judgment, the work they were doing outside of exams, the classwork they were doing, the homework they were handing up, 
the project work that we're doing, that will all have to be taken into account. It'll absolutely affect next year's six years, and I think it'll affect next year's six years more than it affected this year's six years, because um, this year's six years lost uh, several weeks um, of face-to-face -face teaching. Now, they had online support, but that would normally be the time where they would be doing revision work. Whereas this year's fifth year has lost the same amount of time, but that would be the time where they were doing new material. And when and all as our teachers have been working both here and around the country, it is not the same trying to teach someone online as it is teaching them face to face. And the change was so abrupt, there was no lead into it. There was no kind of time to change. It was just going from one system to another over, overnight. So there will be an effect on, on the students. And also because of the uncertainty about September, if those students are not back in school in September, they will miss even more time. So I think there will have to be a lot of serious thought put into how we deal with the current fifth years and how we make their leaving cert fair for them as well too. So we've used a variety of means. At the basic level, we've set up all our students with a St. Fergal's email address, and we've been communicating through that. But that's part of a, an Office 365 platform. So some teachers have been using Teams as a means of communicating with students. Um, some teachers have been just sending work via email. Uh, some teachers have been using video clips and combining, combining the work they send by email with their video clips, uh, which they're posting on YouTube um, uh, as instructional videos. Uh, some teachers have been using uh, other online sources as well too, to do quizzes and that to keep the students engaged. Well, the problem or the difficulty with it is that we're not sure that there's universal access to the technology, and that's the big difficulty. So if I break your question into two parts, for those students who can engage with the technology, that's having devices and having adequate broadband, they seem to be doing okay. I don't think it's a substitute for face-to-face -face teaching, but certainly in the current situation, it's as good as we can probably get. For those students who haven't got access to the technology, I worry about them because there's a risk they're falling behind and there's a risk that they haven't been engaging as well as they should. Yeah, that's going to be a really interesting exercise because uh, as you can see, schools are very tight and cramped spaces. And like our school, part of it dates from the late 1930s, early 1940s. And it was, wasn't built for massive numbers of students. So social distancing is going to be a huge challenge. The only advantage we have is that we have the summer to plan for it, and hopefully we'll be, we'll be further down the recovery road in relation to how the country deals with the virus. And we have, we'll have a greater understanding of the virus. So maybe there are things that we think we would have to do now we may not have to do in September. But if you just take putting 300 schools in our building, uh, th sorry, 300 students in our building, and uh, getting them to be socially distanced, that's going to be an almost impossible challenge. Mm. Um, so we're going to have to look at how we keep the virus out of the building. Uh, and I think that's the, the first task. Uh, and then how we engage with the pupils once they are in school. Uh, and I am not sure what that's going to look like yet, but at least we have three months over the summer to begin to think about what it'll look like. Uh, my name is John Campion, I'm from Tranmean, right down in County Leith. Um, well, initially it was, we found it restrictive enough, but uh, uh, living out the country, we had an advantage of, uh, you know, the freedom. You can go out in the fields or yeah. around the, the, the yard, the back or front yard, you know. I have great sympathy for people that were, um, would be living in towns and cities because with, without any freedom, anywhere, any freedom to go. Um, right. But you had to be conscious, of course, of, of uh, meeting people and, and keeping their distance from them and all that. When? Well, that, that's uh, one of the, that is one of our problems, really. We have grandchildren and uh, daughter and uh, her husband and two children in Sligo. We haven't seen them since Christmas. And we have two uh, other family, and I have son and two, two uh, his wife and two children again in, uh, in that low one. We haven't seen them either. Well, we can see them on, on the... The phones. On the phone, on yeah. the internet, but... Uh, yeah. It's not the same as meeting in reality. Of course, yeah. Um, well, sure, that's the trouble. Everything was, well, you know, everything was taken for granted. It's only when... The, when it came along that people realised the freedom they had and uh, it's only now that we, we appreciate it. Yeah. Well, the first thing we were going to do was visit our children. 
is, you know, we had a going to go to strike up. We have a new car there for the last few months and there's not a thousand kilometres on it yet. <laughs> so we, we, we aim to, to... Travel, to go travel. places. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Well, sure, we always have the, you know, um, we'll go out and look at the cattle and uh, we can go to the bog and try and save the turf. But it's been easy this year because we had wonderful weather. I never, I never saw such wonderful weather. We got no break since, I suppose, a month of dry weather. Actually, some people are looking for rain, but <laughs> not everybody. Oh, we, yeah, we, we go up most days, you know. It's, it's a great, healthy place. It's wonderful air, and yeah. Terence knows that. He used to go running there one time. <laughs> Keep we don't busy. hold hands or anything. <laughs> we can't pass that stage. <laughs> we do all this travel together, yeah. Hello, my name is uh, Father Martin Delaney and I'm the parish priest here in Rathdowney and Errol for the last eight years. In fact, I marked my eighth anniversary a few weeks ago here, so... Um, and I suppose this has been the strangest time uh, ever in the eight years that I've been here. If any, I was thinking on my anniversary that if somebody had told me eight years ago that there'd only be 40 people in the church on the eighth anniversary, I'd have thought, my God, what have you done to, to run everybody out of the church? But anyway, that's what had happened. So, so here we are. Well, it's been a huge impact as it has on every parish throughout the world, I suppose. But, well, I suppose one of the, the great pluses was that a little over a year ago, we had installed a, a webcam into the church here in Rathdowney. We had intended putting one in Earl as well, but unfortunately the um, broadband or whatever was needed technologically out in Earl just wasn't good enough at the time uh, for us to be able to put in two. But, and it was a big decision because it was a big financial commitment. But, um, and the reason for doing that at the time, I suppose, uh, was to allow people, in the first instance, maybe elderly people who are, uh, you know, who don't come out to church anymore, to be able to participate in mass in their own local parish and uh, to keep up with the news and the community and keep connected in that way. And also for, say, particularly for funerals or weddings, family occasions, where there might be relatives living abroad, and we'd had the initiative, which I had borrowed from a church in the north of Italy where a priest had asked his parishioners to send in photographs of themselves and their families and he, he put them in the church and so we had had a lot of photographs that were taken here over the years, uh, some by Terence and some by Mary Delaney and um, we had them and so we enlarged them and, and laminated them and put them on the seats and um, then uh, people started sending in photographs uh, when they were knew what we were doing. So there were literally hundreds and hundreds of photographs. So when I used to go out to celebrate Mass, I didn't feel I was alone in the church because I had all these smiling faces looking up at me. Um, so that was great. And then we were allowed to have a few people join in in terms of reading and music. And that was a great blessing to be able to have a small choir. And that's been a great addition over the last couple of months. So that meant that we could stay in touch. And in many ways, I had never felt more connected than I did over the last few months. Even though we were physically distant from each other, there was a real connection with people. And that was great. And then it had this idea about, you, were there other ways that we could use the, the webcam? And the idea of having uh, a concert. I mean, I'm very conscious over the last eight years that there's enormous talent, music talent, uh, in this area, not just in this parish, but in our neighbouring parishes. So it asked a few musicians and singers locally, would they be willing to maybe do 20 minutes on the webcam on a Tuesday at lunchtime? And it just took off. I think we've had nearly 20 weekly concerts. We haven't, there hasn't been a week since uh, I think the middle of March that we haven't had. And uh, mainly from Rath Downey from Boris and Ossery, a little bit further afield. And they've been fantastic and they've had a huge uh, audience. And uh, somewhere along the line, we discovered uh, that we could record them. We initially didn't think we could. So they're now up uh, on videos on the website. And I, I'm staggered when I look at even the one we had last Tuesday, there's been something like 1300 
viewings of that concert since last Tuesday in less than a week. So it's extraordinary and I suppose it's because so many things are cancelled this summer, particularly any form of live music. So people are happy to be able to maybe, while they're having their lunch on a Tuesday, to tune in and um, enjoy some music, really good music, but also local people that they know that they'll have heard live themselves at various functions and occasions. And it's been great. Then another thing I suppose that I was very conscious of, a big part, a feature of our summer in Ireland is the idea of the cemetery mass. And people come from literally all over the country and even people abroad book their holidays to be at home for a cemetery mass. And um, so we wondered how we could possibly do that. And thanks particularly to, again, to Mary Delaney and, and to Maureen Gilfoyle, we were able to produce I think a, a very fitting kind of tribute to those who have, who have died and are buried in our three main cemeteries, in the, the two here in Rathdowney and also the one in Errol. And um, so, yeah, so, so those we, we broadcast on three Fridays there in June. And again, uh, I think people really appreciated that their loved ones were um, remembered. And we'd also had a special tribute to those who died either within the parish or connected to the parish in the last 12 months. So, yeah, we, it's been great to be able to stay connected. And in terms of what people have written and have said, and they've used that phrase, they use that word in thanking us to be able to be connected. And I suppose that says something about maybe the last few months have been a time of loneliness and isolation and people not being able to physically meet their friends and their neighbours and their family. So anything that was going to help people to remain connected to their community, to their family, to their parish, uh, was always going to be helpful. And I'm delighted that we've been able to do that. And that's been great. Well, I suppose, Hannah, I would say that in some ways the, the locking down was the easier part. The opening up has been a little bit more of a challenge again. I suppose we were delighted when we heard that the churches as part of, I think it was phase three, could begin to open again. And initially we we opened the church uh, for people to be able to come in for private prayer and both Errol and Rathdowney have been open for the last couple of months for that. But then in the last month, we've been able to have a small number of people come to mass. We're limited at the moment to a maximum of 50. So yes, we had to put, I mean, like every business, every organization, every group has had to, um, comply with government uh, restrictions and advice. Uh, I mean, particularly around the two meter distancing, that was the biggest challenge to determine how many people we could have in the church. And I suppose one of my biggest fears was I didn't want a situation where people would turn up at the church and would be turned away uh, from their own parish. I mean, there's so much about this opening up which goes directly against what we would normally be trying to do to bring people in, to people as close together. That was much communication. Here, we're trying to keep people apart and to keep people away. So we did put together a plan, our parish council, and um, we appointed a, a COVID coordinator. And um, with her assistance, we were able to put together a plan to allow the church to be opened. We have ushers at the weekend. We have a system by which people reserve a place to come to Mass on Saturday and Sunday. And we've broken the, the list of parishioners up under alphabetical order. So we divided into four initially. So uh, that's how we've been doing it. The numbers um, coming have been relatively small. I think some people are still very nervous about coming, uh, being in, in, the, in an enclosed space. Some people perhaps didn't like the idea of having to reserve to, to come to Mass. Um, but um, we've also had perhaps more people coming to Mass during the week because that's what we've asked people, you know, to consider the week as opposed to Saturday night and Sunday. That, um, you know, if you want to come to Mass once during the week, come during the week if you can and leave the weekend to those who maybe can't come during the week. So generally speaking, it's been working well. Personally, I have to say, um, and I suppose there are not too many situations where someone is looking down at a group of people wearing masks, sitting for three quarters of an hour. I personally find that 
difficult. Looking at a group of people, it's very hard to have any sense of an expression on people's faces. People wearing masks look frightened. If they look anything, they look frightened and look somewhat uncomfortable. They may not be, but I'm just, from my experience, looking at people. So I'm finding that hard to get used to. Um, um, and there are not, probably not too many other situations where that happens. You meet people in supermarkets or in other places, uh, they're passing you and they're wearing masks and you know we're getting used to that. But sitting in front or standing in front of a group of people wearing masks who are looking up at you, I'm just finding that hard to get used to personally. Um, but I'm conscious that it will be part of the new normal for a long time to come. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I suppose everybody says until there is a vaccine that's widely available to people, we won't be in a position to be able to have big numbers of people together again in any social setting, um, be that in a church or in, at a concert or, or whatever. I mean, we have an annual concert here in the church every December. I know we won't be able to have that. Um, you know, I'm also conscious, I mean, so many weddings that I had booked in for this year, have the vast majority of them have been uh, postponed until next year. Um, I have one or two weddings that are going ahead towards the end of the year. But even talking to those couples, they know they're probably going to be very restricted to numbers. Um, how how does a wedding as we experience it function in this you know, people together, uh, people sitting together for a meal, dancing, music. Um, how does that all happen in a, in a time when you have to be socially distant? And I don't know. I, I, I don't imagine it's an easy uh, thing. And I know lots of couples struggled with that. Maybe for some, the easier decision was to cancel and or move it to next year in the hope that um, you know, things will have returned to some kind of normal, and I certainly hope it will be. Um, because I would be very conscious that while people have made a huge commitment and made a huge effort around what we've been asked to do, I'm not sure that can go on indefinitely. And I mean, you can even see at the moment signs of, you know, people's fraying patience, I would say. Uh, of course, the next big thing for us and for so many other parishes is the reopening of our schools at the end of August, which is only a short few weeks time. And um, there's a lot of confusion about that. And uh, whether we can do that safely or not, I hope we can, because I imagine the children have suffered um, both academically, but also socially being separated from their friends. And uh, so I certainly hope that that can happen, but uh, I would be worried about how that's going to happen, you know. Yeah. And there doesn't seem to be any clear direction because maybe nobody knows how it can happen. And I suppose it's all down to how this virus um, progresses and how it develops or doesn't and whether we can suppress it or not. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time, Father. You're welcome. Thank you. Over the course of this video, we've spoken to people at the beginning of lockdown, in the middle, and just before we thought all restrictions were to be lifted. But today is the 14th of August 2020, and Leash is currently back in lockdown, along with Offaly and Kildare. We don't know what the future holds, but what we do know is that we can get through this by pulling together. This is the time to be slow, to lie low to the wall until the bitter weather passes. Try, as best you can, not to let the wire brush of doubt scrape from your heart all sense of yourself and your hesitant light. If you remain generous, time will come good, and you will find your feet again on fresh pastures of promise, where the air will be kind and blushed with new beginnings. We'd like to thank the people of Rat Downey for making this possible. 
Pulling together with us is what makes Ratdowney a great community. Thank you.